time for the fan favorite segment, the fans on the touchline on my for this particular fantastic Saturday afternoon. It's chilly, but of course we're talking matters sports, uh, and you can tell us what is happening in our neighborhood. Just get in touch with us via Twitter. Handles at Wasike Maxwell at Asoro Bat hashtag touchline Y254 and at Y254 channel. As well, of course, we're going to delve into matters international football and analysis of the same fixtures and English Premier League coming to a home stretch. Manchester City and Liverpool seem to be the favourites for the title crown. City seeking to defend while Liverpool being a serious challenge, of course, after beating Huddersfield last night. 5 nil demolition, all goals scored by African player Sadio Mane, Mo Salah and Nabil Keita. Joining me right now to delve into what has been happening and what is about to happen this particular weekend is Joe Saina. Big man! Yes. You know, <laughs> have you been first of all? I've been very much okay, have you been? Easy, I'm alright. Uh -huh. You know, I think two months ago, Yes. I warned one man called Ronald Okoth. Yes. That he don't need to be coming on this particular show, uh -huh. looking decent, better than I am. Yet I'm the main person here. You know, I'm the host. <laughs> so, so have I defiled? Have I defiled that uh, that order? You violated I've that directive. <laughs> <laughs> and going forward, probably will hit to the call. I, I'll make sure next time I hit to the Just call. Just try to look inferior. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You are putting my work uh, at, at, at risk. At risk. I may as well switch the seats with you now. Yeah? Well, Osoro Robert, you know, is just sitting here, but. Osoro is mad at me. Very <laughs> forward. <Yeah. laughs> anyway, forward. what's good? Well, I mean, the running is becoming tense. If you look at the fixtures remaining, especially for top four, I think number one, two might go down to the wire in terms of the remaining fixtures for Man City versus Man, uh, remaining fixtures for Liverpool. Um, Tottenham, I believe today after a win with West Ham, against West Ham, will solidify the third position place. And then now the battle will be between Chelsea, Manchester United and Arsenal. That's for the top four. Osorio Robert, as you speak right now, Man United has lost consecutive against Everton and against Manchester Derby, and they face another acute task this particular weekend tomorrow actually against Chelsea Football Club, which is seriously chasing for a top four finish. Any chances of? Oh, I think Manchester season is done. Their season is over completely, and they have solidified their place at I think position six currently, and they don't look like a side that can get into the top four and do something and even if they get into the top four they still don't have the mantle to go ahead and play in, in the uefa champions league so for them in the uefa champions league they should forget that they should start thinking about rebuilding a team back to the class of manchester united because the team that we are seeing currently is not a good team it's a team that switches on and off sometimes when Olaguna came in they were playing good football all of a sudden, they are losing seven matches of the possible nine that they have played, and this is consecutive losses. So it's a big, big problem for Manchester United. I'd like to differ with, with Osoro on that. Mm. I don't think we should call Manchester United quits yet. Look at the remaining three fixtures. If they pick up a point uh, tomorrow against Chelsea, and they win against Huddersfield, and they win against Cardiff, they have every chance to come back to the top four. But and Chelsea is... have everything to lose at that position the, the thing is and if you look also at the running for mm -hmm. arsenal fixtures and the chelsea fixtures versus the manchester united fixtures mm -hmm. you might think mm -hmm. that manchester have a greater chance to finish at the top four you so, might think yeah you see finishing the top four is a big deal it's not a big deal if for manchester united yeah. this is a team that can finish in the top four it should be finishing in the top you realize four. that yeah. but then they don't show that they don't play the football to give you the strength and belief that they are capable of being in the top four you look at the how they play their football you realize that today we play well tomorrow we don't play well you just need consistency to be on that top level you look at manchester city you look at liverpool you look at tottenham they have maintained the consistency even arsenal when if many people say arsenal are not playing well and all that they have played some good of consistency with them, you see. Mm -hmm. They're in the semi-finals of the Europa League. They are now in the fifth place fighting for a top four position. And they are showing that intensity. They are showing that intent that we want to be in the top four. But for Manchester United, look at the discipline against Everton. Even 
I don't think Fulham can play such kind of football. <laughs> for, uh, because Fulham, they are on relegation. Yes. They have won two matches, keeping uh -huh. two clean good sheets. Yeah. But you look at Manchester, it's a team that completely went off the rails. Mm -hmm. They cannot defend, they cannot run back, they cannot strike. You cannot even know where's the stamina of Manchester United, where's their strength, and they were really off. Look at Manchester City. First half, they give you that glimpse. They give you that glimpse that we can play well. But at the end of the day, they are not good enough to play well. So, top four position, even if they finish the top four position, they'll still be lying to themselves that you are good enough, which they are not. And, and, and is top four finish becoming elusive? Because two teams pushing for, you know, qualification to UEFA Champions League football next season are not performing very well. Both Arsenal and Man United, two teams have lost their previous fixtures yes. consecutively. Arsenal mm -hmm. has lost to Wolverhampton Wanderers and uh, they also lost over the weekend to mm -hmm. Crystal Palace and so is Man United against Everton and Manchester City. Is top four finish race becoming too elusive? I think if as I mentioned earlier, you, you would look at the fixtures that Arsenal have, the next, the next three fixtures. Um, you would look also at the fixtures that Chelsea have, excluding Manchester United. Still have to play uh, Leicester City. Um, if you look at now the, the, the fixtures that Manchester United have, um, obviously Huddersfield and Cardiff. Cardiff fighting for relegation to survive. Huddersfield already, their fate, their fate have been sealed. But as Osorua said, and I think it's a major problem, not only for Arsenal, but also for Manchester United. For Arsenal, Una Emery inherited a team that has potential. Yes? But inside that potential, you always have problems, certain problems in the team. You have, you have uh, Ramsey going to Juventus. You have the uncertainty of um, Mesut Ozil. You have, again, the uncertainty of the, of the midfield, Quenduzi. Again, Torreira. He has not been performing. The game against, as you mentioned, Crystal Palace, midfield was completely dead. I watched that game. Yeah. Um, and even defence Gordon Mustafi yes. was awful. Uh, you, you can see, you, you saw what happened against Wolves. So the idea and the notion that rebuilding needs to be done is, it's important for Arsenal, but not as much as Manchester United. But Manchester United also needs some serious overhaul. A proper overhaul. And here's the thing. I remember, I remember when Mo Jose Mourinho was being fired. I remember I sat here with you and I told you it's a, it's a, a fresh breath of air that a new manager is going to come in. Even if it's an interim going into a permanent or just an interim manager. But what we have realized over the past couple of weeks is that you can have David Moyes, you can have Louis van Gaal, you can have Jose Mourinho. But if you look at the set of players that are there, yes. that's, that lies the problem. It has never been the manager. It has been the players and the board. Why do I say the board? When Klopp came in, he was given a cut blanche of power over Liverpool players. That's why he could sell Benteke and no one could, could say anything. Manchester City, cut blanche again. Yaya Torre would go. You, you see, there's no discrepancy that Yaya is a good player, we're paying him X amount of money. But now let's come to the Manchester United squad. We have Alexis earning so much money. But again, it's a problem in the dressing room. Scoring three goals. Not only that, but also in the dressing room and yeah. also on the field. We have Paul Pogba. On a good season, he can give us 15 or so goals from the midfield. But his on and off theatrics are the problem. What does the board tell Ole Gunnar Solskjaer? Here's the thing. Manage, please manage Pogba. He's, he's cost us close to 100 million. Revenues are coming through him. Let's handle him well. The problem is, once you don't give the manager the power he needs, the power that Ferguson had to tell Cristiano Ronaldo, you know what, you can go. To tell Beckham, you can go. To tell Roy Keane, you can go. The same power that you can tell Pogba, either next season I want you to play in my team, under my rules, or you can go next season. Because there are a couple of players, not only Pogba, there are a couple of players. Herrera has already gone to PSG on free transfer. We have the likes of uh, Valencia. His contract is not going to be extended. There are three to four players that need to go. And there are two players that need to come in. You come in, solidify the defense, and proper work through the next two transfer windows. But the power has to go back to the manager. There is this I, I think that uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's winning form revol revolved around Ander Herrera, who now is being rumored to join French money Paris Saint-Germain. Why do you release a player 
on a free contract who's been you know in sublime form for the club at the expense of extending his contract that's what he's talking about you realize that manchester united at the moment is being held by player power then Kuroi came said it, that these are the same players who threw Mourinho under the bus yes. and they will do the same thing to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. These are not the kind of players you can trust yourself to be, to be your engine and to go ahead and do something for you. And you have seen how they have been doing it. One of the things is, Ander Herrera is a squad player, he's a team player, but he's not earning the same amount of money as the people who are not team players. People are not squad players. Correct. This will bring problems into the team. I think Pep Guardiola, that's one of the major reasons he did not take Alexis Sanchez. He did not buy Alexis Sanchez to Manchester City because you'll come in with a very huge salary gap that is going to make other people inferior. And players will come to a team when they'll know this is what I offer. I'm good at this and I'm doing this. So why are you not giving me the same amount of money that is being given? You realize David De Gea is at the same circle where he's also beginning to get a lot of money. Paul Pogba, everybody is talking about there's a kind of strength his agent has over him. That's why he's also beginning for more money and should go to Real Madrid. So as Manchester United and as the way they have been put traditionally, Attitude has been key. And if they do not get their players who have got the same kind of attitude as the other players, the manager just needs to get rid of them. Yeah, we have in social media get players. Get rid of them and have mm -hmm. players who have the budget hat and can play for Manchester United. Because at the moment, there's no player in Manchester United who looks to be a Manchester United player. You would argue. No one is you, playing for the shirt. No, no one is playing. And, Attitude and is no one can play for a different shirt. Yeah. You look at the Manchester United squad right now, and you ask yourself, as a Tottenham manager, as a Liverpool manager, as a Man City manager, even as a Wolves manager, how many players from Manchester United can you take and put in those teams? Yes. No one. None. Uh, no. There is no hunger anymore. They're just there Maybe for Paul, the prestige. Maybe and David De Gea. De Gea, no, 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 for, the no. last, for the last four or five seasons, I can tell you for free, De Gea has been the standout player for this Manchester United team. He has come to the rescue of Manchester United when the goalkeeper is needed. Marcus Rashford has rose up from the, from, from the youth system. Jesse Lingard, Martial but coming the flags, in. They have been awful. Yeah, they have been awful. Again, a deeper form happens to players, but it's how you bounce back. 2-0, sorry, 1-0 Barcelona. 2-0 against um, the, next, the, the next loss. Again, they came back to Barcelona, got beaten. Went, went, got beaten. You look at six fixtures or even five fixtures that you have lost. And not by a small margin, by at least two goals or more. That should tell you something about the character. The other, the other, but, day, but the other day when they played, um, when they played against the, the derby, Manchester City, first half. I mean, they were brilliant. Yes, they were an inferior team. We have to accept that. But they were brilliant. What happens in the second half? Um, Pep brings in Sane. What does Sane bring? Pace. Broad pace on the left side. The second goal, if you saw the formation of the last four Manchester United defenders, it was on a diagonal instead of a, you get, in, instead of a straight line. What was going on? Again, it's the mentality. Mentality. I, I think the, 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 the thing is, that notion of how you rise up for the next game is what is killing Manchester United. And... No matter which team you play against, let it be Barcelona, let it be Wolves, let it be Bolton Wanderers, you have Everton. to be up for every game. And Manchester United are not doing that. They just come in, oh, it's Barcelona. We're going to play them the best we can. It is PSG. We have to go against them. But this is Everton. Ah, we can just go and play the way we want and come out of it. And that has been the, one of the major problems that they are having. Let's talk about the PFA Awards. And of course, uh, the list was released in midweek and several standout names as far as PFA is concerned. Mm -hmm. Goalkeeper, of course, Addison for Man City, Robertson and Alexander Arnold, uh, right back and left back respectively in the defense, uh, Laporte and Van Dijk, who is the overall PFA Award of the season. Then in the midfield, we have Bernardo Silva, Fernandinho, and Paul Pogba coming in, and the attacking department, Sadio Mane, Sadio Aguero, and Raheem Sterling. How comes one man who's been in spectacular form for Tottenham Hotspurs, yes. Christian Eriksson, yes. is not making that, the team? That's the same point I need to make. I don't understand what Pogba is doing on that list. 
I totally don't understand. Ericsson has been brilliant for, for, for Tottenham. He has pushed that team to the semi-finals with the help, obviously, of the likes of Llorente, mm -hmm. with the injured Kane. But Ericsson in that midfield with Wanyama partnering him, it has been brilliant, except that Wanyama came in later on. So I don't understand how he's not on that team. Bernard Silva, again, a revelation for Manchester City. Definitely. I mean, him taking over from David Silva, it's like a, a, a clear switch. You know, you don't understand the transition. You know, it just happens so quick. You look at the front, the front three, you know, Aguero, Aguero, Mane, you know, Salah. You, you pick them from the top teams. If it wasn't the fact Salah that Salah didn't make the team, Sterling yeah, did. Sterling did. Salah didn't make the team. But again, you would you'd have those options in the defense. Well, Van Dijk, Laporte, um, you know, Alexander Arnold. They deserve it. There's so, this so right back who plays for Crystal Palace. He's English international. He's Juan called Bissaka. Juan Bissaka. Juan Bissaka, mm -hmm. in comparison with Trent Alexander Arnold. Yes. Of course, the young Englishman has been also tremendous for Liverpool. But one Bissaka's impact has to be hailed as well. It is, uh, the Professional Football Association, the only reason we cannot go hard against them is because the professional footballers are the ones who vote. And that's where you find someone like Paul Pogba making into such a... Because he has many friends? Yeah. At the end of the day, actually, it comes down to that. Someone say, ah, Pogba, I will give Pogba my vote. But it's not down to merit. Not down to how good is this. Because you realize that the only thing that the professional football association they have done this time round was give the accolade to a defender who deserved it van dyke he has played i is think is he the best defender in the world right now surely in the premier league it's yes. very hard to determine that but in the premier league 18 clean sheets for liverpool this season you have not considered you have considered less than 10 goals that's a very big big push for a defender and everything that he is doing so it's a very good for and for him he has solidified liverpool defense because it had been leaking and this time around they are one of the best defenses to go up again so that one is a good one for them i mean ruben neves is but missing from that list ruben yes. neves John is, not in is missing from uh -huh. that list uh -huh. You know, Troy, Troy Dean is sorry for his injury. He's missing from that list. I mean, they are decent players. Again, I think club power comes into play. Club power comes into play. Because that's also, influential. You, you cannot let away the dominance of the two sides. Man City and Liverpool, they have really, really dominated the Premier League at the moment. But also if you look at Wolves, Watford, Leicester City. I mean, those three teams have also pushed up. If it was the fact that um, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer came in and he had that honeymoon period of 10 unbeaten games, if he did not have that 10 unbeaten games, you, I would be telling you now, the top four um, you know, fight would have been even about Wolves and even maybe Watford. If it were not for a scenario where the coach of the season comes from a team that has bagged English Premier League title, do you think Wolves coach yes. deserves being Nuno Espito, Nuno Espito deserves it. Nuno Espito deserves it very well. He came up with a champions team, a championship team, this team that he has right now. He hasn't bought anyone when he came in. He, most of them have been on loans and he told them, here's, here's what I'm going to promise you. We're going to play Premier League season, Premier League football next season. Let's win the championship, let's go into the Premiership and let's qualify for at least the Europa or win the FA. The FA has gone away from them. It's going towards Watford and Manchester City. What are they remaining with? Qualifying for a possible seventh position for the Europa League. I think he's done brilliantly with, the, with those set of players. Alisson versus Adderson, who deserved a spot in the team. Well, that's Both are Brazilians and they are competing for the <laughs> spot at the national team level. And, uh, you know, they have been uh, exceptional for their respective sides. But Ederson making the team for PFA at the expense of uh, Alisson, who made the team uh, going by the voting by the fans. Uh, I think uh, it's all about what the two goalkeepers bring on to the table. And you realize that Ederson has been solid even if he has a very good defensive back, but his defense cannot be compared to that of Liverpool. I think that role of him being a sweeper can be the main reason that he's getting that title. You can never know. But there are two goalkeepers who are at the top of their game at the moment. They are top of their game at the moment. And Alisson is pushed because he's got a very, very good solid defense that is in front of him and people cannot score against him. But then Ederson plays the, the Guardiola kind of football. He really comes up in front, he goes ahead, he sweeps the ball. It's like a, their last man defense in that defense line. And I think that's why they gave him that title. 
Of course, away from Matas PFA awards, we're going to speak about the fixtures for the weekend and main trailing tie, of course, beats Chelsea against United. And both are pushing for UEFA Champions League football next season to finish in top four. And Chelsea are in Europa League and by the fact that they win the same, they can qualify automatically. And so is Arsenal, who will play Valencia at the same final stage. What are the dynamics of this type? Manchester United would, would definitely at the moment would have an advantage because um, Chelsea will be thinking about their midweek fixture coming up. Um, Manchester will be thinking that you know we can get a point of Chelsea, and I strongly believe that's what if you give Ole Gunnar Solskjaer today a point, he would accept it. I mean, sorry, tomorrow um, he would accept it. But um, going into the running again, I think Chelsea would would look for the title, would look for the Europa League title. I think for them right now, that will at least end the season in the right way. Because now, if you don't end with the title, the Europa League title, you're remaining with a battle for the top four, for, you know, top four between three teams. Arsenal again also has its fixtures. So you would think, you know, logically speaking, let Chelsea win the Europa League, let Manchester, see, let Manchester United see if they can finish top four, or again, Arsenal either win the Europa League or finish top four. Again, the dynamics are very, they are very tricky. They're very tricky. Eden Hazard has been such a revelation since joining English Premier League from League One, where he featured for Lille. And of course, it's Arsene Wenger, former Arsenal coach, who actually scouted him. And at some point, he wanted to acquire his services to join Emirates. But, you know, I think it was Jose Mourinho back then at Chelsea, mm. who, you know, surpassed Wenger's chase for the Belgian international. What do you make of his impact tomorrow? I was also surprised he didn't make PFA. Yes. And yet, he's been a Chelsea player of, you know, previous seasons, despite not playing an attacking football, scoring even crucial goals when Chelsea need them most. I think he has won two Premier League titles and a FA Cup with the Chelsea Football Club. I think for Eden Hazard, it's a matter of uh, the other players at Chelsea not coming up to his level, standards of playing football, and that has been that gap between Eden Hazard and the other Chelsea players. So it has been really difficult for him. But he has done his best for Chelsea and what he can offer Chelsea at the moment. And for the Manchester United fixtures, I think it has usually been a two-way kind of traffic between Chelsea and Manchester United. The other time, under Herrera can put him in his pocket, does nothing. The next time, he bursts out of nowhere and is troubling Manchester United left, right and centre. And the form at which Manchester United is at the moment is really tricky for them because if the way they played against Man City, the way they played against Everton, that La Castra kind of slow walking, kind of football that they are playing and they taking on to play against Chelsea. Chelsea is going to dismantle them properly and Eden Hazard will be the one leading that line. So it will be tricky for Manchester United tomorrow, but it's also a game where they can redeem themselves. Yeah, Let's have a look at the you know, stats of Chelsea against Man United uh, since time immemorial. Of course, statistics indicate that overall 176 matches, 53 draws in between them. Then United has recorded the largest number of wins, 72, against Chelsea's 51. But there is a statistic that lies. You see, this is an all-time statistic. This can go back to 1800. But down look there, there is a Premier League statistic. Don't, don't go even go to the Premier League statistic of 50. That's from 1990. Mm -hmm. Look at the statistic from, let's say, 2010 up to now. Because who, who 1990 Chelsea was not in the yeah, of public domain. Yeah, not, not, yeah, not even not in the known, it was not recognized as such. And even up to 2000, the late mid 2000, when Roman bought Chelsea and made that overhaul, everything was, I think, they were competing at the same level. But from 2010 up to now, Chelsea has won a Premier League. Manchester United has not won any Premier League. Chelsea have won FA, Manchester United have won FA, but which team has done better than the other? You realize that Chelsea has tried to be a little bit better than Manchester United. Manchester United, have, since 2013 when Sir Alex Ferguson left the team, they have been going down, they have been going down, they are not coming up at any time of the moment. Last season finishing number two was a bit better, but 
the one at Europa League. Yeah. Yeah. Euro- Europa Cup jo, with, uh, yeah. Jose but Mourinho. I miss those days of Chelsea against United where Chelsea could, you know, line up players like, you know, uh, Peter Cech, mm-hmm. uh, John Terry, Gary Cahill or Ricardo Cavallo, Frank Lampard, Didier Drogba, you know, Michael Balak, Man United on the other hand, Ed, Rio Ferdinand, Edwin Van der Sar, Nemanja Vidic, you know, Owen Hargreaves, Wayne Rooney. Mm. Stellar, stellar squads for both teams. Can we compare to the current era? Well, you know, if you, if you put aside Hazard, if you put aside um, Kante, because Kante has been performing very well for the last three seasons, if you put aside, well, Diego Costa is not there anymore, um, and you put now the Manchester United squad, obviously, um, back to back the last three seasons, I think performance-wise, obviously, Chelsea has been on top. Um, Manchester has not been that stellar as we would want them to be. However, it's a transition. And we keep on using this word transition oftenly, but it is a transition. So it's we getting get, tired. Yeah? It's, 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 you know, we've been saying for the last three seasons, yeah. give Manchester United money to buy players. They've been having 200, 300 million pounds to be buying players. But what has happened? You know, you're not bringing in the same crop of players that are leaving. You get. And this is why, you know, we have to loud, we have to loud Liverpool, we have to loud Manchester City. You know, you lose a big time player, you replace him with a big time player. You get? We have to understand that of the dynamics of the purchasing power has been different. Hence, you have to go to the youth system. But if we tell that to Tottenham, Tottenham will tell us that's a fuss. We've been having the same squad for the last three seasons. Because Daniel Levy is not generous enough to give no, not, Potetino enough money to Not only is he not no generous problem. enough, but if you look at the youth setup, again, if you look at the youth setup, the players that are coming from the youth can determine a lot about the club. Look at this. Manchester look at City this. doesn't have a youth setup. Look, look at this. They have a youth setup. How the, many youth now, guys come in? Now Tottenham is coming back to have uh, money power. With the new stadium, yes. they, are, they are making, I think, 800 million per match day. Mm-hmm. Better than any other club in Europe. Better than most of the clubs in the Premier League. There is no actually club in the Premier League that is getting to what Tottenham is making per match day since they moved to their new stadium. So don't be worried when Daniel Levy is going to give Pochettino 50 million. He's going to give him 100 million to go get that one player who you think is going to make a difference for Tottenham. The one player who is going to make other teammates play better. The one player who is going to change the team completely. And they can do that because right at the moment now, they are generating the revenue to do that. Through stadium. Yeah. They are generating the revenue and they can go ahead and by the players that they want. For Manchester City, it is the owners who use it as a toy. For them, it's, not, it's the Etihad and everything. But the moment you call Sheikhi and you tell him, I need 100 million, not going to deny you that. He's going to give you that money. For Manchester United, team that is in the stock exchange with a serious board of directors, it's more about, we give you 100 million, are we going to make 100? Are we going to make 200? So those questions have Shop to be asked. Went yeah. Down, yeah. Yeah. Those yeah. questions have to be asked. But for Manchester United right now, they have to start thinking the way Sir Alex Ferguson used to. The success of the club is in the football ground. Forget the revenue that you are generating. Forget the money you are generating. Those successes will come mm-hmm. if you are winning on the football ground. And at the end of the day, your work as a manager, your work as a football club, as a sports person, is to make people smile. And if you're not doing that, you have already failed at your job. Your job is not how many t-shirt sales you are going to sell. Yeah, in the bigger picture, that is it. But the major, major thing is, the moment that fan finishes the 93 minutes, let that fan smile. If the fan is not smiling, then Joe, how relevant is the position of technical director in... Uh, Football of nowadays. I mean, I mean, it's quite important because what he does. I've seen several clubs acquire the services of technical director. Leonardo, mm-hmm. former coach, was at some point in charge of, of Paris and Germain, but we didn't see much of his impact. Yes. How, how, how significant is that position? It's, it's a significant position because now the manager has a one on one relation with the technical director and tells him, um, these, are the, these are the players I want. I don't want to deal with I don't want to deal with their agents. I don't want to deal with you know the financial bit of it, like what play, managers would do uh, a couple of seasons ago. And it's his job now to go and get these players. The problem is 
when the board believes in the technical director or the or, or yeah or the technical director too much than the manager himself whereby now a situation in Chelsea whereby uh Pulsic, was his name Pulsic, the guy who was bought from Pulisic, Pulisic, Christian. Pulisic yeah Christian Pulisic was bought from Borussia Dortmund Sari came out and said I don't know about the player um but if he comes in we, we will join the squad and we will play the Sari board the fact that the manager doesn't know anything about the player shows you that some players are acquired in clubs by the technical director without the know-how of the football manager himself, of the manager himself. So like now, Manchester United are moving in to make Mike Phelan the technical director or the football director. Um, and now his relation with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is going to be very important in the rebuilding of the squad. His job is basically simple. Which players do you want? I want these players. Go negotiate, talk to them see if they are viable for the club. I think the, the technical director is to bridge the gap between the board and the football club. Because the board is majorly on to business. Yeah, the board is more on to business and how much money and we're making and all that. The technical director is supposed to come in and bring the balance between the football players, the technical bench and everybody, and the board. You can look at the best example will be Edwin van der Sar. See what he has done with Ajax. This is the person who will go out there and negotiate the player, the player's income, the player's salaries, the transfer fees and everything. So the board will like that kind of person who represents the board, who can speak the language of the board and also speak the language of the manager at the same time. Mm -hmm. You realize when Manchester United was successful, it used to be David Gill and Sir Alex Ferguson. But that used to be like the old system of running the football club. David Gill ran the board and everything. Sir Alex Ferguson ran the field and everything. If Ferguson needed a player, David Gill will know how to convince the board to give you that money. And that, that, that will be his key job. And the technical director coming from a football background will understand the coach better when he says, we want this player, we have this amount of money. You look at Liverpool, they haven't just had an overnight kind of success. It has been a, a, process, gradual process. a gradual process for them to get into where they're supposed to be. You sell two players who you think are not good enough, you buy one who comes in and takes care of that position. After some time, you realize, hey, our defense is linking. What we have done here is an over. Let's bring in Van Dijk. So, Klopp can be capable enough to convince the board to give him 75 million because they are seeing the eventual gradual process that is going on to build the team process by process to get to where they're supposed to be. Gentlemen, we have to wind up this and before we do, Champions League football next week, as Liverpool against uh, Barcelona. Barcelona did put up a La Clasta show during their first leg against United. They beat them 1-0 but it was not you know, convincing, not impressive show but during the return leg of course Lionel Messi was Lionel Messi we are used yes. to scoring uh, crucial goals for the Camp Nou best side. How well prepared are they to take on Jurgen Klopp's charges? I think I think it, it should be the other way around. The question is how <laughs> li how are Liverpool well prepared to because take on Messi? Because going uh, by the yeah. word from the pundits, mm -hmm. Liverpool or Manchester City, if mm -hmm. either of them was playing Barcelona, mm. going by the first leg of what Barcelona did against United, Barcelona were beatable. Yes, but you see now, if, if Man City would have played against Barcelona, again, it's just two similar systems that could have played. What would have come out, the outcome would have been the stronger team. But now Liverpool are coming with a totally different approach. Counter-attack press. They have defenders that are fast enough to run back, to keep the likes of Suarez, Dembele, obviously, and Messi at back. But the most important thing about this Liverpool squad that really, you know, brings the strength in it is the midfield. The midfield is what this Liverpool, Liverpool team has. And I'm telling you, that midfield, Fabinho holding just before the four defenders, and then you have either Nebi Keita, and then you have a or, uh, or uh, Milner over there. I think that solidity in the defensive part of the, of the midfield is what is going to help Liverpool go forward against Barcelona. That being said, we've always said that Messi is out of this world. He comes up with brilliant moments. We cannot deny that. But from my standpoint, Liverpool, Liverpool will win the first, the first leg. I think for that match is who wants it more? Who's going to win that match? Who really wants it 
more and who is going to run more than the other one, who is going to attack more with that, who is going to be disciplined better than the other one because these are two powerful teams that are going to meet one another. The, in my mind and in my stomach, which I don't want to give it to Liverpool, I'm inclined <laughs> to give it to Liverpool because of the pace that they have, having been there in the last final and also losing at the final must be a stab on the heart of those players. So they really need to come back to that final and also try and perform in it. At the moment, it's shaky with the Premier League. They don't know if they're going to have it or not. Mm -hmm. So they have a chance to go into the final. Barcelona have won yeah. the match and it can confirm them as champions. Yeah, so, so we are looking at a situation where on Tuesday, mm -hmm. you can be playing a Barcelona team that's already champions of La Liga. Uh -huh. And you still have to wait till the last, the, the last fixture. The wire. The wire to be confirmed that you'll be, you'll be a winner. But if you look also at this other team, if you look at also um, Ajax versus Tottenham. Tottenham. Tottenham and Ajax have never been to uh, no, Ajax has been there at this stage. Tottenham has never been. Look at the Ajax setup. New players have come in, young players, hungry players. The combination of that team is 23 million pounds. Okay. The combination of the Tottenham team is 120 million pounds. Okay. But what Ajax did to Real Madrid is short of a miracle because you'd expect them to be the underdogs. And the same way they're going to walk into Tuesday's game as the underdogs. But I'm telling you, Ajax are going to do something different in this semi-final. Okay? Let's keep the conversation going via social media platforms in, even after the show at Osoro, but at uh, CK Max or at Y254 channel, hashtag Touchline Y254. We discuss about matters, international football fixtures for the weekend and even Champions League football coming next. We do this again next Saturday, same time, same place. Always a pleasure being with you every Saturday, one, two, three. Talking matters, sporting disciplines across the board, happening both locally and beyond. And you yourself, you can join the conversation and don't be left behind. Tell us what is happening in our neighborhood. And for the fans on, you can tweet us and come on the show and defend the team you support. And then Nottingham Forest outside there, like myself, you are welcome. Touchline has been the show. Bless. And have a fantastic weekend. Joe, thanks, man, for coming through. Always it's been a, a pleasure. pleasure. But heed to my call next time. <laughs> Robert Ozoro, what's up next, man? Well, it's a good day to start the weekend now. Cheers, man. Enjoy and have a fantastic weekend. But let's keep it sporty, you know? Bless.